This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you guys deserve to be happy? The answer is yes. Stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. Right now, I have a special offer for you. Get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at BetterHelp.com slash L-Y-B-K. That's Better, H-E-L-P.com slash L-Y-B-C-A-D-E. Thanks again for BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Guys, welcome back to another episode of Lay Your Brick. This episode, we have Caden Butera. He's a film director based in North Idaho and owner of a production company called Paradox Studios. He started and filmed at age of nine, making projects with his brother Rylan, who is currently a major collaborator and music composer. Caden was able to direct his first feature-length film last summer, a body swap rom-com, and has another feature on the horizon. Please, he's witty, smart, fun. You guys are going to love this episode. Stay tuned. Hope you guys enjoy. Right off the bat, I just want to know how you're doing, though. How's everything going? Uh, I'm doing pretty good, man. Things are going relatively well. Uh, gearing up for the next feature, which has been crazy, getting crazy busy with that. We're trying to shoot it in July of this summer. So Ooh. lots of things to do, <laughs> lots of things that need to be done, but, uh, it's exciting. Yeah, so. that's true. Cause you're gonna, yeah, that's good. That's going to come up quick then. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's technically a couple months away, but it's, uh, before I know it, it's going to be here like next yeah. week and I'm going to be shitting my pants and <laughs> dude, <laughs> nothing's going to be ready. Uh, well, that reminds me of, okay. So Kate and I did a 50 hour film slam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, what was mm-hmm. the title of that again? Yeah. The 50 hour slam. Yeah. That was really fun. And we had to like do it in 50 hours where you had to like write film and then edit and submit it and all that and stuff and 50 mm-hmm. yeah that was a blast though but i remember working under crunch time it was that was insane so yeah no that's in a weird way the pressure is what makes it really fun yeah, yeah. <laughs> knowing that everyone is under the same constraints as you and you're against impossible odds so anything that you do do that is good um is an extra thrill um because it's like an impossible task so anything that yeah. comes out slightly good you accomplish the impossible. <laughs> That's so true. You remember? Uh, okay, so I don't know for the viewers that don't know this. I had a I had a podcast before this. It was called Timeless, and uh, it was only on YouTube. But I had Caden Butera on here um, on that podcast, season one, episode nine. And I was mm. wondering if you remember that. There's some questions that I actually took that I'm going to ask you now. Oh shoot! Based okay. On those okay. because it's yeah yeah. So oh, man. Uh, I think the first one is, hold on. I have to go to it now. <laughs> the first one was the last time that we talked, you said that mm-hmm. you weren't exactly sure, like what you wanted to direct because mm. we'll dive into this obviously. But for those of you who don't know, like Caden is a phenomenal director among, among other things, but thanks dude. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you didn't know exactly what you wanted to like direct, like because you were talking about how people, you know, like Michael Bay, like that's action and then stuff like that. So I wanted to know, has that changed and have you found your element more now? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I completely forgot about that question on the podcast. Uh, I was super hammered. Blacked out entirely <laughs> that that moment. No, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> um but uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I probably answered something along the lines of which is the cop out answer of, you know, anything that feels like a good story. You know? I think that's what and you said. Yeah. yeah. And it's true. And it's what most people would say. Um, I don't think anyone wants to direct a bad story. Um, mm. <laughs> but as far as like a specific genre, I haven't really settled into one yet specifically. I'll tell you the ones that don't make me as excited to work on and those are like strictly speaking like romances or straight up dramas um but but it, i like elements of those genres within other genres like i love a good uh you know romance drama i i like okay. um you know a, a a dramatic thriller i i like 
action and I, I do, I'm a huge fan of sci-fi. So I'm leaning more towards um, that. And I love genre mashing. Um, I, so the first feature film, I, I got to direct my first feature film two summers ago. That was a romantic comedy body swap movie um, about oh my God. Uh, two people swapping bodies. And it's a, it's a comedy and it's a r- romantic movie at the same time. And I love meshing genres. Um, that's really fun. And then the, the feature we have coming up is a sci-fi thriller. And mm-hmm. so I, I really like being able to grab like the best elements of this genre and the best elements of this genre and mixing them together and, and getting the audience something slightly unexpected. So, I mean, that's, that's still my, my answer is still pretty vague as far <laughs> as I I'm, I'm not like action movies all day long. Cause I yeah. like being able to dabble into maybe some comedy or maybe some like a straight up thriller drama. Um, but uh, action really interests me and sci-fi really interests me and comedy. And, and if I can mix all three together, um, I'm having a hell of a time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to say though, like, I mean, I, everything that we've, that I helped you out with, which was uh, moon Knight and the 50 hour and God, what else did it, was that it? Or would I, um, like I'm trying things, to I remember, like. um, yeah, I think we did that but, snuff film um, in Mexico. I don't know yeah. if you remember that one. I remember. Yeah, that one. We Classic. were pretty up. Yeah, it was to die for, I'll <laughs> tell you. <laughs> no, I wanted to ask you, why, so why sci-fi, though? Because most of your channel, most of your stuff is sci-fi. Yeah, a good deal of it. it is. I mean, I've been since, you know, uh, I was – since I, the first movie I could watch, I, I've been loving Star Wars and Star Trek, the, the big sci-fi franchises. Something about um, science fiction has always like spurred my interest so much. Mm. Um, and, and it's it's basically like a, a mega exaggerated form of reality. Um, and as is fantasy. But for some reason, I was never into fantasy as much as sci-fi. Something about... Um, the science base to it and the, uh, the, the futuristic setting and the technology that was always mm-hmm. so exciting to me. Um, and, and I've always just been drawn to it. And I, I can't specifically tell you why, because it's not like those elements on the, their own without good characters and without a good um, story is entertaining because it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you mix all those together and there's something extra magical about that genre for me um and and some of my my favorite movies that i always go back to is is going to be like the star wars and the and the big sci-fi franchises because those are just um when done right like really take me back to being an eight-year-old kid again i see yeah so there's like an element of that like makes you feel kind of at home with it like childhood so yeah in in a way i mean that being said there's a lot of super dark um gritty um (laughs) sci-fi that don't necessarily bring me back to childhood per se but it's almost taking like a fun childhood concept and then putting an adult twist on it like district nine for instance i don't know if you've seen that movie um an an excellent movie by neil blomkamp which is a a hard r a movie about you know it's basically they take these aliens um this the classic alien story and then they make it kind of an allegory for um immigration in america <laughs> it's it's, oh, wow. it's a it's an excellent movie I I um, but yeah and just just taking an exaggerated like bombastic topic and then using it as a metaphor for these very real things um are, is also super impactful if you do it right so uh, why uh do you think it's harder to you said that you like to kind of all combine like the genres. Do you think it's harder to make a movie like that? Or do you think it's kind of easier for you? I mean, I think that it's in a lot of ways it's, it's easier because I mean, the genre is basically identifying key tropes in a story. And if it, and if it hits a certain number of tropes, then it's considered part of the genre, right? Like if you're, um if you're if you've got a big spaceship and at the center of your story um are some extraterrestrials and and some futuristic tech that doesn't exactly 
exist, that's they're going to put that into the this this science fiction category. Okay. And so these genres are are playing into what the audience expects. If I'm going to rent a movie that says sci-fi on it, I will expect like these key aspects. Well, if you add another genre to it, they're also going to expect these key aspects. And so when you're going and writing and creating a movie with multiple genres, you have more tools in your arsenal to pull from. You can like now you can pull from these aspects and these aspects and these aspects. Um, and the flip side of that is if you don't deliver on the aspects that the audience is expecting, you actually have more room for disappointment. Um, mm. and, and something that I've kind of learned recently is whether the audience will say it or not, yes, they want to be surprised and they want to see something new, but if they're going to spend like their $10 on, a, on an action movie, they're going to consciously or subconsciously expect to hit a, a certain number of action movie beats. And if you don't deliver on that in some form of satisfying way, they're going to be disappointed. Mm. Um, and so the more expectations you layer on top of your movie, um, the, the more, you know, you, you better fulfill them. Um, so it's interesting where uh, I know this is a long answer, <laughs> but no, you're the, good. the last project we, we did that we're working on is, was a zombie Western movie. <laughs> um, it was taking the Western genre and the zombie <laughs> genre and basically meshing them together. And it was really fun trying to find a way to deliver for both fans of Western movies and fans of modern zombie movies like all the tropes that they would hopefully expect um, and mix them together into something they wouldn't expect. Uh, so it was a lot of fun playing with that. That's insane though. Like the, there's a lot of more, like a lot more science behind it than I thought. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, a, that's, I guess my, my stab at how, why, how I think about it. Someone could, could say it in a completely different way but that's kind of my outlook on it as it is currently but i mean that's so smart too i mean because your outlook is i mean i feel like it's right you know you know what you're doing so a lot a lot of it like you're hitting the right beats like what you're saying like it, it's so true because we're gonna be expecting that and expectation is everything so right if you can learn how to use that to your advantage and know that then for sure you're you're kind of set on an easier path than most people if like they start out or are even doing it now like right i mean and there and there's of course ways to working within big genres can be like really really fun um from like a writing standpoint because you know right away what the audience are going to expect and if you're a really really good writer um which i'm not saying i am yet <laughs> you can get <laughs> ahead of that and then um like do what what ryan johnson did with the movie knives out i don't know if you've seen that yeah movie. i have uh but that movie is a, a whodunit movie and then within the first 20 minutes they tell you who done it and then everyone in the audience is like wait what because <laughs> you you've come to expect the uh like a certain type of structure with these movies but then mm -hmm. of course you he twists it on its head and it still is a whodunit movie and the the who done it isn't actually the main question you really want to know because he strings you along on this whole other thing and i won't spoil it um, but that's a guy who knew the expectations of the genre he was working in and flipped and flipped it on its head yeah that was a i love that movie i love yeah that it was a, a good movie i really liked it a lot there's a have you seen this is a little off topic, but have you seen Inventing Anna on Netflix right now? Oh, is that the one with um the the actress from Ozark? Um, or, or am I thinking of that? Like, she's a blonde think. blonde actress. Yeah. Um, I I I have not seen it, but I've okay been seeing the ads for it and it looked interesting. Dude, I I started watching it, and I'm no like film critic like you, but I will say that it is like I love watching it. It's, I'm on the edge of my seat. I think something bad's gonna happen, and then nothing bad happens. Like it's so weird how they, right? They just know how to get you. So that's why I bring it up because that's kind of what that I haven't seen anything like that that's made me feel like that except Knives Out. So yeah, it was interesting no, to me. Great playing with the audience expectations for for better or worse because you want to learn when to deliver and then sometimes learn to not deliver when they're expecting you to, but yeah. then deliver somewhere else. Um, because you don't want to necessarily be a, Hey, I know you want all these things. So I'm not going to give you any of that. 
Mm-hmm. Isn't that so new and like risk taking? <laughs> sure, but then people are going to leave disappointed. Yeah. So you have to find that that balance a little find bit. That balance it. Mm-hmm. Let's start. Let, okay, let's go. Let's go back to when you were a wee little boy. Mm. How did okay, all this two, start? Two years ago. Okay. Yes. <laughs> two, yeah. Two years ago. How did all this start? Really? Because okay, so you're very talented at drawing. Like I wanted to hit on that a little bit because I uh, I was looking at your Twitter feed last night. <laughs> And, oh yeah, my Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you have this drawing of walrus. Was it walrus? <laughs> walrus man. Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. But see, you did it, and it, and it was 2010, I think, and then you did 2020. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh huh. Dude, yeah, it's an insane. old photo and the current photo. Yeah, <laughs> it's insane that progress. So I wanted to talk about that, but I want to know where it all started. So did you start drawing? Did you start taking photos? Did you start filming first? Like, what was? Right. I mean, I guess. Technically, I started drawing first because, you know, I've been probably the, I picked up a crayon once and yeah. slid it across a Chili's table. And that was <laughs> that was drawing before film. But I mean, I've yeah, I've I've been a, I, I've loved drawing for a long time. It's it's always been a hobby, though. I don't think I ever was like, I'm going to pursue a career in this. OK, um, but I've always really, really enjoyed it. And I, I never get to do it as much as I, I want. I mean, I consider myself a fake artist from the standpoint of <laughs> I can draw. And I think once I, I I can finally reach a final product that I am proud of, but it takes me probably eight times longer than anyone else with actual talent. <laughs> and, and I can't draw anything without looking at a reference as a general rule. Um, so yes, okay. I guess I, I've done a lot of comic art, but it is taking like an obscene amount of time. And I have to be looking at a reference to someone else's line work. I'm not tracing it, but I, I have to have some form of reference um, because it, like the true comic artists out there uh, and I'm a, I'm a huge comic fan and half the reason I'd say 70% of the reason I buy comics these days are just to look at the artwork. <laughs> um, okay. The wow. true comic artists out there, they have like this uh, um, amazing uh, knowledge of the, of human anatomy, <laughs> because yeah. if you're going to be just like drawing Superman and Superman has a skin tight outfit, right? He like these artists know exactly like how the, the triceps roll into the bicep and how like the abductor muscles form um, underneath the shoulder muscles. Like they are like, that's true talent that I, um, <laughs> I, I have not spent the, the time or the practice or the innate talent to, <laughs> to call myself one of those people. Well, that's um, what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I don't want to cut you off, but yeah, like you, either way like you're still talented in what you do because even if you're looking at a reference you're still recreating something or even creating something new so i think that's really really cool um thanks and what was i gonna say with that though uh, oh yeah you're saying when did uh uh after that when did i start film right you asked me when i started that yeah i wanted to know like where you started first but hold on before that though i wanted to say really quick is uh okay so you said that it takes you a while to draw things right Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. like how did you get from 2010 to 20 that that's 10 years but like it's amazing like probably not to like maybe to you but i don't know but i'm saying like if you look at it from a perspective like that like Mm -hmm. 2010 drawing like that to to now to 2020 like that's insane so how did you did you just keep practicing keep drawing just for fun or like right i mean yeah, just just slowly but surely um, staying at it, um, and, and and yeah, I mean, I guess realizing what type of art style that you like and like studying that a little bit. Um, and when I say study, I just mean like like being a cat. What I, I I love the the style of like of modernized Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby is the the modern. Um, or sorry, he's the he's the like golden age Marvel illustrator, and it's like really harsh, crisp black lines and like really punchy, um, like muscles and um and a lot of lots of contrast, and that's kind of evolved into like my favorite version of modern comic book art, which is like 
now my favorite artists are like Ivan Rees and I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. And Jason Fabuk, who are, in my opinion, taking Jack Kirby's like old 1960s approach and basically adding a bunch more details. But this, the essence of that, like hard, deep blacks, contrasty comic book vibe. Yeah. And, and basically me, every time I read a comic book, like taking notice of like, why, why do I like this so much? And like, and, and looking at the page and, kind of trying to understand that style um, and not just like going, Oh, that's nice. But going like, why is it nice? You know, <laughs> that's cool though. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's the question. Yeah. And, and then, and, and that's the same thing that I, I do for, for anything when it comes to cinematography or whatever, instead of just going like, Oh, I really like that. Like really going, I'm going to figure out why I like this and how exactly these, these people do what they do. So I can try to, do a poor man's uh replication <laughs> um but but yeah so i guess just like understanding art um the art style that i like and try and practicing um mm -hmm. every so often and, and and trying to i guess continuing to to do it until i'm, I'm happier with it that makes sense then yeah yeah so yeah like so then we'll move to that so where when did you start all of this? I mean, I know it's a broad question. I know you've probably been asked that so many times, but. No, yeah, you're good. I've been uh, doing shitty movies since <laughs> I was 10 years old and I never stopped. Uh, nah, he's lying. <laughs> um, eight or 10, I forget which, which it is. Uh, okay. Maybe nine and a half. <laughs> uh, but around there, I just started um, picking up a camera and forcing my brother to help me with my movie projects um and now years later um he and i are both doing uh <laughs> film professionally uh, my brother is a super talented composer um and and he's composed mm. the last couple of projects of mine and we also co-wrote the current uh feature film script that we're going to be shooting in july together um so yeah i guess just um, the, the age old story of, you know, I had a really bad uh, <laughs> shitty camcorder and, and wrestled my brother into it. And, and then after he was busy, started forcing my friends to be in it. And after mm -hmm. my friends were busy, you know, slowly but surely taking that leap into asking maybe some of the theater people at high school. And then after that, eventually venturing out into more professional connections to the point where I was actually um working for hire for uh videography and photography services um and and worked in the uh the marketing department for a um as a product photographer and videographer for a long time um and eventually just op opened up my own uh production company called paradox studios and um we uh, I don't want to say we I mean me and my whole family <laughs> are actually it's a family endeavor now uh, are, are working on producing uh, and creating content. So my mother is actually my producer slash production manager and my father who has been um, for for decades a, a commercial banker is now my line producer and, and handling the financial sides of production. And, you know, we come together as a team and um, for better or worse, we're a movie making family now. <laughs> that's, that's awesome though. Yeah. I'll, I'll say a couple of things here. Like, yeah. Shout out to your parents because whenever, whenever I was on set and we were doing something like they're always so helpful and oh, absolutely, I mean, it's insane to me too, because I mean, not insane to me because I've, I've been blessed with really great parents and supportive parents, but yours are very supportive of you and like what you want to do. And I imagine absolutely. You know, like, yes. so that's got to be fantastic to have because, I mean, that's definitely probably pushed you in the direction that you've gone. I mean, it's hard to do uh, what you're doing, what I'm doing too, but mostly what you're doing in, in the sense of like, you're creating things and you're trying to get them out there and get paid for it and, and keep living through all that stuff. So that's awesome that they're supportive. So shout out to them. But yeah, 100%. I am definitely in their debt and continue to be in their debt um for just having us a, uh, a big support base like that i feel like is is crucial especially when you aren't born into like a big hollywood connection or born yeah. into lots of money neither of which i uh fall i fall into neither of those categories mm -hmm. but what i do fall into is having um parents who have been incredibly supportive and have been there from the from the get-go 
um, helping me, you know, push through this, this path. Yeah. Um, because I mean, a lot of people, you know, you can, you can move to uh, a, a big city and if you're like, you know, the son of Tom Cruise, like you already have so many feet in the door, but, but coming in with, with nothing, like you have to have some part of uh, having a support base is, is super helpful. Yeah. Um, not to say that people who don't have that can't succeed, but I would say that it probably is much harder um, <laughs> having yeah. the backing of your family and your friends um, for a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's such a privilege to have that. Um, let's talk about that for a second. So your, so, okay. So moon Knight, which by the way, I know you've seen it, but I can't believe Disney took your idea and put it into <laughs> a show now. <laughs> yeah, all right. Where's my money? Yeah, I created the Moon Knight character. A lot of people don't know that. Um, it was me back in uh, 1980 who invented the Marvel character. And yeah, they just went and stole that guy. I can't believe that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> but I, I mean, a little context is, yeah, we worked on a, a, a Moon Knight fan film for the Marvel character. Um, which at the time he was a bit more obscure. Um, I mean, he was still a very popular character, but now um, everyone knows that, or just about everyone knows that, uh, that he's going to have his own original uh, Marvel show on Disney plus, yeah. uh, which is super exciting uh, as a Moon Knight fan. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait um, as a, filmmaker who made the moon knight fan <laughs> i am furious i'm not a part of it yeah um <laughs> but uh <laughs> you know it's fun. when i first saw that i was like i immediately thought of you i was like i thought of it i thought of it and i was like really it's like i can't believe they're ripping off caden be right now um but <laughs> right, yeah i mean right. you should have at least something in there like that that's anyway <laughs> they don't need me i mean the people over at disney have people way more qualified than than me making that show at least i hope i haven't seen it yet yeah, no, so no kidding, fingers yeah. crossed it's good um mm. but i appreciate that <laughs> no yeah um but what i wanted to bring up with on that moon night when we were on the set and doing things and um this is like 110 percent uh compliments right here so just be ready for that <laughs> i'm so but, ready yes um like you were so friendly, but let me elaborate on that. So please were, do. Yes. Yeah. So you were friendly to the crew. You were friendly to the cast. Now I don't want people to think, well, I mean like not to discredit you, but like we weren't working with like a thousand people. Right. But it was a good like amount of people I thought. And, but what, what I liked about it is that you did, you were directing it. Okay. You were, you were filming parts of it. You were, mm -hmm always there with resources and locate like you got all of that stuff ready but like on set you were never like it, it wasn't like you were what am i trying to describe here <laughs> you were never like angry upset mad like flustered like every single time you were always making sure everybody else was having a good time you were always making sure Everybody else was laughing. You were making jokes. You were doing this. We were doing that. But then we were serious when we were doing the cuts and the and the scenes and the and like you were making sure everybody. It, it was just amazing to me to see that because I don't think that like, and I could be wrong, but I don't think those big productions necessarily have that all the time. Where it's like it kind of felt like by the end of it, like we all felt like a family. Like we were all doing stuff together, and it was like so important to me that like that was that was just a key takeaway for me. Is like you were always business but you were also also like friendly making sure other people were good and like it was freezing cold some nights and like <laughs> you were just always like everybody else was top priority and i love that because it it shows a lot of like i don't just like genuinely like genuineness out of you i don't know if that's a word but sure the whole thing i really appreciate that um that i'm glad that came across uh because that was a facade um <laughs> no, yes um i <laughs> no i i really appreciate that and i think that's a, a really important um value that i try to hold in all my projects um especially ones where people 
um, are volunteering their time and not getting paid, <laughs> which yeah, was yeah. Um, that Moon Knight project in particular was, was only possible because a bunch of people who are passionate about working together and working on film volunteer their time to make that project happen. Um, and I feel like I have no place in, in spreading a bunch of negativity or, or acting entitled where people are coming together to like pour their heart and soul into a project for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that's just not right. And, and I mean, and, and also it helped that everyone that was on that project was super positive and amazing back. So there was no real, I had no reason to be negative because that's I didn't true. really have to like kick anyone in line or anything like that. It yeah. was such a great group of people, but, but even so, I, I feel like that that's just an important um, way to to run anything, but especially a, a, a movie set where let's say like everyone is getting paid um, regardless. Like I really if, if people aren't bringing in enthusiasm and positivity to a leadership position, it it trickles down to the guy under me and the person under me and the woman under me and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and it, it just doesn't feel right. And I've actually been on, um, I, I, I remember I, I, I did the whole PA route for a long time, PA being a production assistant. I, mm -hmm. when I was a bit younger, um, I was a PA all the time on a, on a handful of productions and without naming names or naming productions, um, I did not have a great time on a handful of those because mm -hmm. people were just clearly there be because they didn't they didn't give a shit about the project they didn't give a shit about the people and um and it shows um and they weren't treating people with like the respect that they should have and so and, and that was a point when i was a, a bit younger and i kind of heard the horror stories about like you go into those big hollywood movies and everyone's terrible um, and so I, at that point in my life, I was like, oh my God, it's true. Yeah. Oh God, what have I done? And I'm like, Are, is this going to be like this on everything? Um, however, um, I was on some, some other larger productions. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to name them, so I, I just won't. Okay. Um, but I, the biggest production I'd ever been on, I was PA on a couple of years ago. And this was a, a big TV show that everyone's heard of. They came from LA. And I'm like, oh, here we go. It's going to be more of the same. And they were the nicest people of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was That's good, a, such a reassuring moment to realize that like whether it, and of course I haven't like made it big I haven't been on a million huge productions so I can't actually speak to how great or how poor people are being treated but with my experience so far um, and if you really want to work with the big dogs and be expected to um, get the call on some larger productions you're not going to get that if you're being a dick. Yeah. <laughs> people want positivity and people want, of course, you to be capable and you to be talented. Um, but I've noticed, at least in my limited experience, that you can, if you're a nice guy that people want to work with, that oftentimes is going to get you the job uh, more than anything. And and so I, I just want to like keep that in mind as much as possible when I'm working that my negativity will trickle down to the people under me. Yeah. You did a very, like very good job on that. Like, cause it, it there was never a time where in that, at least to me, you know, like you said, it was facade, but to me, you know, there was never a time where it was negative at all. Like it was always fun and like, we always did stuff and random stuff. And then, but we also got, stuff done which was super important so yeah. yeah there definitely is an interesting finding that line and and as far as how do you make it so you are super laid back but also not so laid back that people get super relaxed and then yeah. the work doesn't get done mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know that applies to, to to any job outside of film yeah. whether it's you know office job banking retail whatever um but uh but yeah making it clear that that you're there to do a job but this is a fun job hopefully <laughs> and yeah. you're all gonna have fun doing it, it is a is a must to me
I agree. So then this is one more, one more uh, compliment here. <laughs> so people, when I was in high school and even now still, but something that was always valued of me was that I didn't just think about stuff. I actually did it. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that something that I admire about you is that you are doing stuff. You're, you're always thinking about like the next thing, but it's never hurting you. Like, meaning like you can, you look ahead, you're like, okay, what can I do next? You know, look at all the feature films that you're working on. Look at all the films that you do randomly, all the, all the contents that you see, like you submit to that. You know what I mean? Like you're creating stuff constantly, which puts you at such an advantage. I feel like just because you're testing your limits, you're making yourself do this work on top of everything else that you have going on. So like, it was really cool to see that you kept like finding people, projects and ideas constantly. And you gave everything 110%. There's never a time where I thought in my mind, like Caden, now this obviously from an outside perspective, but still like, there's never a time where I thought that you were not giving 110, like everything you cared about to like a detail, but it wasn't in a bad way. Right. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, there were, I mean, I, I will say, after moon night there was a project i did afterwards where coming off the i guess success of moon night as someone who had only been putting out content for youtube and then it kind of getting a couple views for me when i released moon night and it started getting like in the hundred thousands that to me was like i had made it big yeah yeah (laughs) and so my my next project i actually noticed that I, I, I relaxed actually a bit too much. Mm. Um, it was at that po- point where I was like, oh, my, I've been going 110%, um, and it's been working out great so far. How about, on, on, and I didn't say this consciously, but subconsciously, yeah. my mind was like, how about I give this one like 80 and it'll be just fine? Um, and it suffered. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> like the, the moment I kind of realized, or the moment I thought for a second that like, I kind of have this in the bag was the moment um, I started ruining <laughs> my creative endeavors because I, I done Moon Knight and I poured, I, I really did pour my blood, sweat and tears yeah. into that project. And, and it got me to some cool places. I got to be a guest at the Spokane um, Comic-Con um, and, it, and it got a handful of views on, on YouTube and it, a bunch of articles were written about it. And I was like, man, I, 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 I didn't say this out loud because I'm also, I don't want to come across like a cocky bastard. But yeah. in, internally, I was like, man, I, maybe I am kind of, maybe I am kind of good. And then the next project I jumped into and, and just like made a, uh, so many uh, embarrassing mistakes because I let my my mind get relaxed. Um, I, I stopped pushing myself hard because I thought for a second there that I didn't need to. And that was not the case. <laughs> but, you know, you learned a valuable lesson from that. And I think yes. the other thing was, too, is that like, yeah, don't discredit like yourself. Like you did pour everything that you had into Moon Knight and it and it showed it was phenomenal we had viewings for like you said reviews on top of reviews and i remember like you know we were in a facebook group chat and it was just like you know like keep it going like we're going and it was awesome though yeah it was it was was everything so you can't discredit your your you know um right professionalism and everything yeah um so let's dive into a little deeper so like why why is like storytelling such an important thing to you specifically like like what what do you feel like you get out of it you know i feel like it's not selfishness like when you when we're talking about this but like what do you really get out of storytelling this is the million dollar question um i mean honestly i mean i i feel like i could tell you right now um a like a a really well articulated reason as to why storytelling is so important in society. However, none of that was crossing my mind when I picked up that camera when I was eight years old and wanted to shoot movies. So I I could come to you with this, like in this introspective, uh, like brilliantly explained uh, reason why like narrative storytelling is a crucial part of society. But like, again, none of that was the reason I picked up that camera when I was 10 years old. At least I don't think maybe inherently, 
uh, maybe subconsciously. Yeah, subconsciously I'm, maybe. But I feel like when I was when I was ten and I wanted to just start making movies, um, I I think that was just my my favorite form of expressing myself. You know, and, and everyone has their their different ways um, of, of of doing that. Um, but but for me, being able to kind of take uh, my creative ideas and and my my thoughts and put it into like a neatly crafted uh, well back then it wasn't so neatly but a, <laughs> a neatly crafted package that has been like manufactured and edited um to relay an organic thought or an idea I had was just like the coolest thing that I could come up with an idea um that was you know organic and, and felt right at the time but then be able to polish it and manufacture it and turn it into something that you could present to something out to someone else uh was magical <laughs> you know yeah. um and and so that later evolved into um like anything that was my my passion at the time um or anything that i thought was really cool at the time i could put it down on the paper and then make it into a, a polished movie and then be able to show people, Hey, this is what I think is cool. Um, and that is why um, creative pursuits like writing and, and making your own movie is terrifying sometimes. Cause you're basically making a statement. What I made right here is what I think is funny. And if you show it to someone and they don't find it funny, it may, it feels like they don't find that you're funny, you know, <laughs> like when you, when you yeah. make something and you think, say, this is what I think um, is really emotional. And you show it to someone and they don't feel emotional. They, they, they're basically saying like, what you think is emotional isn't emotional. Um, and so you're basically taking what you value and putting it on into a project. And that's with comedy, with drama, with, with any genre, um, in a weird way, whether you mean to or not, mean to or not, um, and then basically give it to an audience and they'll tell you if you succeeded. Um, and something about that thrill <laughs> is really yeah. exciting. And I, and I think that's why I, I jumped into it at the time. Um, and, and now at this point, it's it's because I'm I'm such a fan of watching movies and being an audience member for good storytelling and can see how valuable good storytelling can be that I love being able to take a stab at it myself. Dude, what a spectacular feeling though, like that you get, I mean, if you really think about it, the stuff that you create, like you get to change, not necessarily change, but you get to like make other people feel a certain way. Right. Um, and then that's to me is, is so fun. If you're succeeding, you can take people yeah. down a, a roller coaster of, of your own design in a weird way whether yeah. it's a good roller coaster that's that's a whole other thing <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but yeah um yeah. super fun because i love being in the chair uh, as an audience member going down a roller coaster myself so being able to to go in and, and design one is is so fun <laughs> it's not fun when people get off the ride and think it sucked uh, <laughs> I'll, yeah. tell you, I'll tell you that much uh but but yeah i, th I think that's in a, in a very vague maybe too abstract way of explaining why i was interested um in the medium at the time <laughs> no but it explains it i mean it, i could see it when you were talking about it that like it's obviously something that's super important to you and it has been for such a long time now i mean to be able to craft what you do in a day and in the scenes that we do and the stuff that you create is amazing. I mean, you have so much knowledge and time put into everything that you've done at this far in your life. You know what I mean? Like it, and it shows like it, it's definitely very, very cool that I, like, I'm so glad I know you because it's just, a, it's it's very <laughs> Thanks, cool man. to see that because, you know, for a while, like everything that was like, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to, uh, you know, make movies and, and stuff like that. And, it, and it's changed now, but, <laughs> but I love that. Like, it almost like I get to kind of like live through you, but I don't know. Is there like, is there any uh things that like you wish, like not necessarily regrets, but things that like 
you could go back and like redo like at like the start of everything that you were doing or no? As far as like career moves that I wish I would have not done, or do you mean like projects that I wish I had done differently? I guess kind of like just career and life moves that you've done. Like, I, I guess we didn't even really go necessarily into that, but still. Right. I mean, probably like any moment where, like I said, after the, the project after Moon Knight, any moment where I felt like, oh, I, I actually made a successful one last time. So I'm, I'm not going to try as hard this time. Uh, slap myself in the face. I would yeah. do that <laughs> if, I, if I could go back. <laughs> Um, and I, I've done that in little instances on a handful of projects every now and then um, is the moment I, I've realized um, I, I, I the moment I think that I've like made it and I would never verbalize that out loud is the no, moment I start no. making the most mistakes. Um, and so and there's been a handful of of projects uh, like that. Um, that I wish I could like go back in time and and tell myself that like there's two big ones in particular where I had a really successful uh, big project um, and then the next one after that I I just like kicked my feet up just a little bit when I was making the next one and uh, and it suffered yeah. uh, that would that would be the main main thing is and and the more I talk uh, listen to like the the big um, creatives and the, and the big directors uh, talk and like interviews that I watch online, all of all things that they have in common, more or less, they s are talking the way like I would expect a student to talk because they're so and they're not like putting on humbleness for show. They yeah. genuinely think that they have so much to learn. And these are like my idols. Um, and I'm like, they think they still have stuff to learn. That's crazy. And, and it's because like, if you truly are like art is subjective and you are never going to get to the point where you just like master movie making, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the, the reason why my filmmaking heroes are so good is because they know that, um, that they're, they can always get better. And it's crazy to think like, what do you mean? Steven Spielberg can get better, but like he, he knows that if he were to just like sit back and go, I got this, his next movie probably wouldn't be that good unless he put as much effort um, into this one as he did to his first one. You know, I, I can't speak for Mr. Spielberg, but that would be my <laughs> assumption. No. You yeah. Know? I mean, I mean, that's so true. Like with anything in life, you, you like you can't master it and you shouldn't even really necessarily want to. And that's a weird thing to say, right. but, but it's true. It's like that lifelong learning. That's so important to constantly be trying to learn what's new, learn what's next. How can I do this? You exactly. know, I think, I think you do that a lot, especially with incorporating different genres into everything, you know, that that's important. Like you're playing around, like, why not play around? Like, this is something that you love to do. So why not explore that and explore everything that you possibly can to like right. really find everything that you want to do. Exactly. And that's a, the interesting philosophy from that, that I have going into every project. Um, and it's not a philosophy that puts people at ease sometimes, but if a project project doesn't scare the shit out of me, then I don't want to do it. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like if I have a next big project coming up and I go, Oh, well that one will be easy. That sounds like a piece of cake then I don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one that sounds like this might be impossible. And I'm like that one. Yeah. That one sounds fun. <laughs> and That's of course awesome. <laughs> my collaborators and, and, uh, and everyone are like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Cause I continue to make life so hard in that department. <laughs> and, but to me, I'm going to choose the thing that sounds like the most challenging um, in, in so many ways. Cause that sounds like the most fun because I don't want to do something that like I've, I've already done that I already kind of know how to do um, more or less. Um, and I, I would say even the people like um, like Michael Bay doing like Transformers five on the surface, it sounds like he's kind of doing the same thing over and over again and say what you will about Michael Bay. Um, but he knows how to get asses in seats and make lots of money. And if you look um, or do you watch the director commentary for Michael Bay's Transformer movies, which I have? Uh, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he talks um, like someone who like, yeah, yeah, he's doing Transformers three. Yeah, he's done two of these already, but he's doing it because like there, there were these new action set pieces that 
he had never done before and saw and really wanted to do and learn how to do them. Like Transformers 3, this is a weird, weird uh, spinoff. No, it's <laughs> but good. like Transformers 3, there's that whole scene um, where everyone's coming into like uh, ruined Chicago in their wing suits. Um, and he had never done a sequence like that and like said part part of what excited him about the Transformers 3 project was being able to do new things that he had never done before. And yes, yeah. it's the third Transformers movie. But I promise you that that guy says yes to his projects based off of what is going to challenge him and, and what is going to excite him more or less. That's, I don't know him personally, but <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, but yeah, no, that that's so true. Cause yeah, if, if you don't have anything that challenge you, like you can't, if you're not fail, like that's the whole thing with the, if you're not failing, you're not trying sort of, deal, right. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you got to do all that stuff and challenge yourself because that's going to push your limits, going to push and see what you are capable of and what you're not capable of. Yeah, what, um, let's go, let's go to paradox studios really quick because I wanted to talk about that. Uh, like, just explain to everybody that's listening right now, because I want to show you out here. You do a bunch of different things with that company, right? Like your company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why don't you just talk about that for a little bit if you want? Yes. Um. So the stuff that I I do more on the day to day um, to pay the bills has been <laughs> um, more of the, the photography side of things. Um, so I do a lot of photography and uh, photography is also just a really fun hobby of mine. Um, but film narrative film is definitely my passion, but I also really enjoy dabbling into photography and I, I do a lot of uh, client work um, in that department. Um, and then also I've, I've done a handful of, of freelance commercials uh, less so now because I'm working on, on the feature. Um, but the, that, has taken me in some weird places as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, if you open yourself up to freelance, um, you know, that means anyone can knock on your door and, and offer you a check. Um, and if it's a big enough check, you'll say yes to it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I've done some, some interesting, I, I'm realizing as I'm speaking, it sounds like I'm shooting porn. That's not yeah, what's like happening here. It sounds a little <laughs> sketchy here, man. <laughs> but I, I've shot like um, <laughs> videos for some politicians. I've shot, a, a, of course, a handful of weddings, but I've also shot um, some surgery videos um, oh, for, right, for yeah. a surgeon who was, who was wanting um, their procedures recorded. Uh, just uh, taking me in, in interesting, interesting places. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's so what about your feature film then? So what are you working on right now? You, so what was your past one that we, that I remember seeing and you were working on though? Is that done? Yes. So yes, the, um, I was able to shoot my first feature film, um, two summers ago, um, in the, in the midst of the pandemic, which is crazy. Of course we yeah. still kind of are in the midst of the pandemic, depending on who you talk to, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it was, uh, that was the, the, the rom-com, uh, body swap movie. Um, and we shot that over 19 days in Oregon and, uh, it was crazy, um, but a lot of fun. <laughs> and and what I, was that called again? Um, that one is called a swap me baby. Um, and that is finally going to be getting a, a release sometime this year on a okay. handful of streaming platforms. I don't know if I can say which ones yet and specifically okay. as to when, yeah. um, but swap me baby. Um, it's, it has an IMDb page. Now I, I noticed Sweet. <laughs> so look it up and you follow check it out then. Yeah. Progress. Um, but that was a crazy project because I'd never done uh, a, a, a project longer than 28 minutes. And so I was able to, I was offered the job to direct um, a, this feature length project. Um, and I was terrified. And that's why I said, yes, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was, uh, and, and I learned a bunch doing that project, but it was, it was a lot of fun and all great people. We came together and, and made that thing. Um, and it, we had like half of the state was on fire. That was like when the crazy 
fires were going yeah. on wow. and then there was the pandemic and then there was like crazy <laughs> wind that blew the smoke into where we were trying to film and one of our lead uh lead actresses was pregnant and so like smoke plus pregnancy not a good combo you had so a lot of challenges and had a handful of things going on um we had a preset to perform an exorcism because someone was totally obsessed with the yeah it was, it was a whole thing i don't want to get into it um <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but yeah there was a lot of obstacles but we we pushed through them one by one and we made a movie and so and i eventually we, we finished post-production for it and have now sent it off and is going to be released to some streaming platforms soon. So look out for that. <laughs> Heck yeah, you guys should. All right. Well, Caden, I wanted to thank you for your time. I want to ask you three end questions that I normally do here. Okay. Um, I'm so but, ready. But was there anything else that you wanted to say? Cause I, you know, I feel like we could do another one of these. Obviously we have a lot to talk about, but um. I believe I've said every single thing that anyone could possibly say at this time. That may be true. <laughs> may uh, be yeah. True. Uh, but okay. no, no, I don't, I don't have any major things off the top of my, my head. Um, I could plug my YouTube channel. Uh, Do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going <laughs> to, if you're watching this, if you're watching the podcast on YouTube here, the moon Knight will be down below and the, oh, yeah. the link because i everyone's got to watch that it's so good um thanks man and your youtube channel obviously okay all right Ken, these are big hitter questions but i asked okay all my guests okay so. i'm so ready all right number one and you can answer in a sentence whatever or as long as you want mm -hmm. what is a daily habit that has changed your life or perspective a daily habit that i do that you do that has changed my life Oh man. Uh, about once a month, I drive down to New York city and I <laughs> stab a man. Uh, <laughs> that's not a daily habit anyways. Oh, right. Uh, daily habit. <laughs> um, well, let me think here. Uh, daily habit. Oh, geez. And wait, because I mean, most of my daily habits are probably negative ones, you know? Um, oh man. Uh, eat a banana. Uh, excellent that's source good. of potassium that's really good um and then i check check my emails you got to do that i recommend to everyone that's... watching that they check their emails because i'm sending so many emails out right now haven't got a response haven't got really? a response Cade. and you know what it pisses me off so it's tough, check your actually emails. it's tough that's I my answer same thing I do, okay mm -hmm. that's good that's a good mm -hmm. answer check your emails i like it thank you <laughs> this is another easy one for you how would you consider your purpose in life right now <laughs> oh that's that's a it's a loaded one um uh let me think about that um my purpose in life as of now my main goal is to get to make movies that i like that i like to make and and get paid enough to make the next one <laughs> that's go. that's my main goal it isn't this it's not fame or fortune yeah. it's to be able to have enough money to make the movies that I want to make and then gain enough money from that to make the next one. That's, that's my, my main goal that I'm, that I'm looking for. And I don't care if I have to live in Idaho or LA or Guatemala to do it. That's my goal. There you go. Guatemala. You should explore Guatemala. It might be <laughs> that my next destination. Yeah. That might be uh, the next. <laughs> yeah. That, that might be like where everything some great actors out of there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you never know yeah <laughs> all right the last one what is something that you wish others understood or knew or no mm. um think deep here Ooh, here's a good one that and it sounds obvious but i think people need to understand that when you write a youtube comment <laughs> on a video People see oh that comment. Uh, <laughs> yes. Something that has become a pastime of mine um, is because now I've, I've, I've made a uh, moon Knight, which has gotten a decent amount of views. I've made a sci-fi film called recursion, uh, which is up on dust. Now uh, dust is a sci-fi channel that you can okay. subscribe to as well. Um, 
And those both of those videos are getting tons of viewers every day. And so I look through the comments and people, you know, it's the YouTube comment section. So they can they can come yeah. in so negative and they write <laughs> the worst things. And the funny thing is, though, is whenever I reply and I go like, oh, thank you for your feedback. They immediately backpedal. <laughs> really? 90 like percent of the time. So when someone like writes on recursion, they go, this movie sucks. I hate it so much. <laughs> um, expecting that like they're just writing their comment out into the ether. They yeah. forget that a human being is attached to this account. And so I read it and I respond. Thank you so much. Like my mom sucks six, nine, six, nine. I'm so <laughs> glad to hear this feedback. And immediately they respond uh, almost 90% of the time they go, Oh yeah, I'm sorry, dude. I just, it wasn't really having it for me, but like, I really actually like the cinematography. Good, good luck on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> like they immediately go just, back into, because they forget so often so that an actual person reads these. Um, I, I do it all the time. I, I actually screenshot it and I have a little collection of every time I've had someone just say like the worst thing and then I respond and they go, like, oh, yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't actually mean that. I was just like joking. <laughs> you can it's actually take funny. a lesson away from that, though, because like, yes, it's so true. Yeah, we forget that like all of our stuff and everything is seen by somebody and especially yes. if you're commenting on people's posts or anything like YouTube. Yeah, like there's another person behind that screen. Like, yeah, and there's just there's that big divide. There's that that big disassociation with because you're not you don't you're not seeing an actual person in front of you. You're you just kind of subconsciously forget that like another human being is going to read them and they have feelings, too. You know, yeah, <laughs> um, not to say that, you know, you can't um express what you hated um on a on a video in the comments that's what the comments are for but it's the people who are just like their blind hatred yeah. that they're sending off to the internet expecting no one to read them uh just remember that people do sometimes <laughs> do so. <laughs> especially Kaden. Yeah. so comment on yeah him. yeah i read all of them um <laughs> yeah of course i that i wouldn't be healthy. making movies if i couldn't handle some like negative youtube comments yeah but still you know for the people who you know maybe have like are a little more sensitive than me be be nice out there you know be <laughs> you nice no well that's perfect thank you so much for the advice kate <laughs> yes <laughs> thank um, you for having me hey man anytime we'll have to do another one and i appreciate everything absolutely anytime all right we'll see you in the next one